Good evening, one and all present here. I welcome you to the second day of the international webinar, Spiritual Wellbeing and Stress Management, a Religio-Psychological Perspectives. Today, this organization is, or, uh, this, or, uh, this seminar is organized by Bhakti Vedant Research Center in collaboration with Kolkata Society of Asian Arts, uh, Asian Studies, I'm sorry. Uh, so the first session is taken by um, Dr. Sarvishtha De Basu, Devasu. She is uh, the secretary of KSAS. And our honorable uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Amit De. Ma'am, please take over the session. Thank you, Shivangi. Welcome, Professor Amit De. I am just introducing you uh, for the session. And you are heartily invited for this session. Dr. Amit De is a professor of history, the Department of History Center for Advanced Studies, University of Calcutta, India. Formerly, he was the head of the Department of History and present Enfield coordinator, Calcutta University. He received a PhD in history in September 1999 from the University of London for his work on the image of the prophet in Bengali Muslim Pity, uh, 1850 to 1947, and completed his doctoral research as a Commonwealth scholar being affiliated to the Department of History, Royal Holloway, University of London. His area of specialization is Islam and Islamic mysticism in medieval and modern South Asia. He published four valuable books, Sufism in India in 1996, The Image of the Prophet in Bengali Muslim Deity, 1850-1947 in 2006, Islam in South Asia in 2016, and one co-edited book between tradition and modernity aspects of Islam in South Asia in 2011. Professor Day is the co-editor of the Bengali academic journal Iti Kotha and the resident editor of Indo Iranika, the comprehensive history of India society CHIS is has selected him as a joint editor for volume 10. They has published over 50 articles on Islam and Islamic mysticism in academic journals. He delivered lectures in famous institutions of India and abroad. Nearly 33 scholars have successfully completed their PhD or MPhil researches under his supervision. At present, eight scholars are carrying out their PhD or MPhil research under his supervision. Apart from examining PhD thesis submitted in Indian and foreign universities, Professor Day also acted as subject expert during the uh, selection of assistant professors, associate professors, and professors in Indian and foreign universities. Recently, he uh, served as a visiting professor in Northeastern Hill University and Vishwa Bharati, West Bengal. Now, I invite Professor Day to deliver his lecture on perspectives on the meditating Muslim mystics of India. Over to Professor Day. Thank you, Dr. Shormishta Dev Basu, for a very generous uh, introduction. I'm extremely grateful to Bhakti Vedanta Research Center and Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the perspectives of uh, perspectives on mend, uh, mending uh, mystics 
uh, in the south asian context uh, i am particularly grateful to dr tinni goshami and dr shantanu de who communicated with me uh, and also motivated me to share my views on this very uh, challenging topic because i'll be speaking about a period when such sophisticated terms uh, like uh, stress like psychiatry like psychology like stress management such terms were not used but people had crises various forms of crises and they also had their own mechanism to encounter such crises so i thought that i can fit into such a program in this international webinar i'm also uh, offering my thanks heartfelt thanks to my long term friend the keynote speaker ferdinando sardella who i know for quite some time who visited our university i visited his university in sweden so without wasting much time there's a time constraint i will directly go into the topic uh, that is uh, perspectives on the mending mystics mending means those who acted as healers by healing i definitely mean uh, physical healing as well as mental healing psychological healing so what role did this muslim mystics play uh, so far as this issue of healing is concerned that we shall try to explore for nearly half an hour and then i shall encounter uh, questions for a lively interactive session now i i just start my talk by saying that uh, symbols are very important for a proper understanding of the ways in which the medieval mystics have aspired to respond to certain questions relating to the crisis that engulfed society in the medieval period or to be more precise in the pre modern period in the pre industrial period now great scholars great indologists or great orientalists like uh, reynold nicholson thomas arnold arthur j arbery they were not interested in ottoman military turban so i have mentioned that symbol is very important i draw your attention to this uh, significance of symbols when you understand uh, this role of the sufis or mystics uh, so far as uh, their the role of uh, sufis as healers uh, is concerned so there are two types of turbans this is significant because sufism is an offshoot of islam it be, it is based on the concept of monotheism but if you look at the symbols used by sufism each and every uh, in spite of their focus on monotheism the symbols carry uh, dual meanings within sufism for example there are dual meanings of the turban uh, that is used in islam one turban is used by the turkish army it is also used by the monarchs of the turkish army or the muslim army which invaded south asia that is one type of a turban which had temporal or political connotation but there is another turban we are interested in this second type of turban that is the mystical turban I, 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 this is also known as mushkil asan in a popular term terminology these healers were also known as mushkil asans that is they cure uh the challenges uh, every, every day uh, in everyday life that common people would face they can cure such uh, such uh, problems this is the understanding mushkil asan so we are interested in this second uh, symbol second turban used by the mystics so the occident that is the western world exoticized the turban of the mystic mentors of terra australis incognita that is the oriental world was perceived by the west by the indologists by the orientalists by the experts by the anthropologists as uh, terra australis incognita unknown land of the east and the occidental scholars had the right legitimate right they believe to explore the oriental world to explore the mystery to define the oriental world and to classify the oriental world so an orientalist is not a, a, an easterner an orientalist is a, a, a person a scholar from the western world that is very much important so terra australis incognita had to be um, explored in support of my hypothesis i would say look at the novels charles dickens great expectations jules verne round the world in 80 days or sir arthur conan doyle the creator of sherlock holmes all have exoticized the orient 
I do not have the time to delve deep into that. But in support of my hypothesis, I use this as my entry point. So when this exoticization of the Oriental world is concerned, under such circumstances, this mystical symbol, this turban, occupied a predominant position because this turban had been used by the uh, mystic mentors or the uh, mending mending mystics of pre-industrial South Asia. That is my, my argument. So now, what is the symbolic significance of this elongated turban, elongated turban, not ordinary turban, elongated turban used by the Mevlevi Darvish who uh, would dance anti-clock. This is not an ordinary turban. This resembles the tomb on a grave. Uh, so underneath the grave, underneath the tomb, the body of a saint is buried. It may be a Sufi saint, it may be a Christian mystic like St. Francis of Assisi or anyone. Uh, so uh, what is the function of this Sufi turban, this elongated turban? It resembled a tomb, resembled a grave. Just like underneath the grave, you bury the body of a departed saint. Underneath the tomb-like turban, you are supposed to bury uh, your ego. Unless you bury your ego, you cannot become a mystic. Now, once you bury your ego, then what is left? Love is left. One ego is, once ego is buried, love is left. No, love is the prime mover so far as this healing process is concerned, so far as the activities of this uh, medieval uh, mending mystics are concerned. Love is very important. Ishq, ishq. So love is important. Love is important in, uh, across the religious experiences, as you know, whether it is Jainism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, whatever, you will find that love uh, occupies a pivotal position in this uh, healing process. So love is very much important. Love can make you uh, laugh. So uh, with this laughter, you can encounter your stress. That is uh, your potentiality to distress uh, is uh, fortified by laughter and laughter can be generated by pure love. So love is very important and love is sustained by the mending mystics of South Asia. And uh, love, ca love cannot be defined or contemplated if you exclude the feminine dimension uh, of love. So our entry point would be the female Sufis. This is very significant. I draw your attention to the fact that when the mending mystics emerged in pre-industrial societies in South Asia, pre-modern societies in South Asia, they uh, portrayed the images of uh, the mothers of the Sufis, of female Sufis, as their role models. Because when you face tension, stress, crisis in the masculine external world, you take refuge in the zenana, in the Andor Mahal, in the internal world of your home, which is dominated by female presence. So this femininity has to be kept at the back of our mind when you understand the nature of this mending process uh, in the pre-industrial societies. So uh, now, again, as I've mentioned, that there are two types of turbans, and Sufis are interested in these dual meanings of uh, symbols that I've mentioned, temporal symbol, spiritual symbol. Similarly, dharvars or quotes, dharvars or quotes uh, also carry dual meanings. One is the monarchical dharvar, another is the Sufi dharvar. Now, healing process is sustained in the Sufi dharvar, not in the monarchical dharvar. Monar monarchical dharvar is the representative of tension. It is that it represents tension. It represents competition in the in the official hierarchy, in the bureaucracy for higher positions, for promotions, for warfare, so, and so on. Uh, for gains, for material and mundane gains, but you will have uh, spiritual solace and peace uh, in the in the dharma of the Sufi. So you have to juxtapose the monarchical dharma with the mystical dharma. Dharma means court. Mm, so that's why these dual meanings are very important. Kingly dharma is associated with war, bloodshed, loss, displacement, tension for promotion in the bureaucracy, and it is dominated by ego. But the Ishq that is resonated in the Sufi music, Sama or Kawali, uh, that is very much important. So Darveshi Darbar is associated with humility, luminous serenity, love, music and poetry. All sorts of creative, engaging activities will be carried forward in the uh, peaceful environment of the Sufi Darbar. That I, I'm interested in the Sufi Darbar. I'm not interested in the monarchical 
Sorbar. So external masculine world was violent. Uh, and Zenana world, or that is Andor Mahal was spiritual, that was feminine world. Inner Dorga uh, world was feminine, it was peaceful, it was spiritual. So non-violent nature of women prompted Gandhi to mobilize women in the non-violent, non-cooperation movement. And I do not have the time, but it is a, it is a very interesting uh, note to take down, that is uh, Gandhi was interested in Sufism and particularly the healing uh, power of the Sufis. But I do not have the time to delve deep into that. And Gandhi often acted as a folk doctor. That is very interesting. Uh, now, uh, this notion, this terminology in the Persian lexicon confirms the Sufi concern with love. And with uh, this focus, pinning their hope on love, they try to encounter the stress. So this love is a stress buster in society. Uh, so Ishq and Mashuk, such Persian terms, gained prominence in the Sufi Darbar. That is very much important. With this, with this notion of love, the Sufis, the mending mystics encountered stress, displacement, warfare, violence, loss in society. The most famous example is also in, in Quranic Surah number 12, where uh, the Quran is speaking about the enrapturing power of love. I do not have the time to delve deep into that. The enrapturing power of love is manifested in the su Surah 12 of Quran. And that is uh, cited by the Sufis again and again and again. That is very much important. It can even be said that uh, Sufism was more favorable to the development of feminine activities than were other branches of Islam. The sympathy of the Prophet for women and his four daughters uh, had been recorded. That is very significant. The veneration of Fatima, that is the beloved daughter of the Prophet, in Shia circles is indicative of the important role that could be assigned to the feminine element in Islamic religious life. So this is very much important. You know the famous Kawali song, Damadam Mas Kalandar, Ali Da Pahla Nambar. This Ali is the husband of Fatima, the beloved daughter of the Prophet. Fatima is the symbol of mystical Islam in South Asia. Fatima is the symbol of uh, the Indian countryside. Uh, so far as uh, Indian countryside is con concerned, countryside is rep represented by Fatima. Ma Barkat, the auspicious mother of the countryside. Very important. Now, uh, there are different types of portrayal of the image of Fatima as a healer. Fatima, uh, during the time of warfare, during the time of uh, community building exercise, Fatima's image has been, Fatima never visited India, but she is very popular among the Sufis. Many Sufis are known as Fatimas. They would take the name Fatima. And even today, Fatima name is very popular in South Asia. Particularly in Iran, you will find Fatima is very popular. This name is very popular. Now, Fatima is compared with uh, Florence Nightingale, the famous nurse uh, in the history of mankind, as you know. Fatima is compared with, uh, her compassion is comparable to Florence Nightingale, who acted as a non-combatant during warfare, as you know. So Fatima uh, is the role model for Muslim women in South Asia and also beyond. And again, in the Indian countryside, Fatima is portrayed as Ma Barkat, that is the auspicious mother uh, there are Jari songs or folk songs uh, which uh, just put emphasis on the healing uh, property of uh, Fatima, the beloved daughter of the Prophet. And Fatima uh, is the representative of mystical Islam. So very much important. Uh, I'm giving you just one example from the Bengal countryside in the 19th century. Uh, so I cannot resist the temptation from, uh, uh, from, uh, resist the temptation from uh, reciting uh, this song. I will make Rani thang dhui dhui phala pani Bibi Fatima Koje Pani, Allah Tui Dere Pani. That is when there is a drought in South Asia. People sing in the name of the Queen of Clouds, that is Fatima. Give us rain. Now this is the commonality. This is, a, a, this is, this is the comparative theological perspective we have to understand in the uh, crisis period nowadays in the 21st century. I need not define, I need not elaborate by crisis what I mean, but you all understand by uh, crisis what I mean. So during this crisis period, we have to study comparative theology. So here in, in Shaddharma Pundarika of the Buddhist, Buddha, Lord Buddha is projected as a merciful rain cloud. In other parts of the Islamic world, the prophet is projected as the rain cloud. And in South Asia, Fatima, the beloved daughter of the prophet, is projected as the rain cloud. So these are important 
uh, comparative studies that we have to take uh, care of. The very fact that the first true saint of Islam was a woman, uh, was Rabia Basri of 8th century um, Basra. So uh, this is very much important. So uh, Rabia is the role model for the Muslim healers, mystical healers in South Asia. Uh, she was the epitome of spiritual activities. So it is not surprising when Sheikh Abdul Haq Muhaddis Delavi, he uh, is a contemporary of Jahangir, he was not very successful in securing a royal favor. So he was a failure at the royal darbar, that is royal court. So he took refuge in the Sufi darbar, that is the Sufi court, which, which had spiritual connotation, spiritual implication, as I have implied quite um, uh, uh, earlier. So here, uh, Abdul Haq Muhaddis Delavi, who was not successful uh, materially, he wanted to be successful spiritually. So he devoted an entire chapter in his famous book to female Sufis as healers, uh, as, uh, as mending mystics of South Asia. So this is very much important. And the famous uh, manuscript is known as entitled Akbar ul mm -hmm. That is a 16th century manuscript. Now, Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia, the most illustrious Tisti Sufi of South Asia, used to say that when the lion emerges from a jungle, none raises any question about her sex. Because the primary concern of the human being at that point of time is his personal safety and security. No one will carry out a research to find out whether that someone that is com uh, coming out from the jungle is a lion or a lioness, because the lioness is actually the principal predator in lion society. It would be relevant to study the role of the mothers in the biographies of the Sufis. Many religious leaders admitted that they received their first religious instruction and even their preliminary training in the mystical path from their mothers. The prophet said, paradise lies at the feet of the mothers. This was emulated by the Indian Sufis. Uh, mothers as mentors. So whether it is Baba Fariduddin Ganji Shakkar uh, or mother of Sheikh Nizamuddin Aulia, they, there is no doubt that many elderly women in the families of the Sufis contributed significantly to the spiritual formation of some of the greatest Sufi saints of South Asia. This is very interesting. On one occasion, I'm giving you one example, the healing uh, qualities of the uh, Sufi mother. On one occasion, there was a drought uh, in Delhi. Everybody began to pray for rain and the Sheikh was requested to do likewise. The Sheikh means Sufi Sheikh, Sufi mentor. The Sheikh then took a thread from a garment worn by his mother. Uh, he held it in his hand and began to pray, Oh God, uh, the chastity of my mother is well known. She had never unveiled her face before the strangers. And I uh, am praying on behalf of this pious lady. Please send rain for us. Uh, after hearing the Sheikh's appeal, God sent rain for them. So in this way, even when there was a natural calamity, uh, the healers were the Sufis, the Sufi mothers. So this is very much important. Now, uh, I move into uh, another uh, dimension. I will, uh, I, I'm arguing that uh, both the elite, elite elements within Sufism, as well as the non-elite elements, folk elements, popular elements within Sufism, they were interested in uh, this sort of mending uh, qualities or the healing qualities of the Sufis. For example, uh, in Sufi circles, Charkha Nama is very popular. That is the uh, spinning wheel. While using the spinning wheel, the Sufi uh, uh, Sufi songs or Sufi poetry is sung. Sufi poetry is often singable. So Charkha Nama, that is known as Charkha Nama. And then while grinding the food grain, the rod, iron rod is used. Iron rod uh, resembles the letter Alif, Alif for Allah. So this is the spiritual connotation. So your everyday existence, your sustenance is provided by this sort of rudimentary elements. And this sort of rudimentary elements acquire spiritual dimensions as they are compared with uh, mystical letters and something like that. And there are other types of songs. I'm not going into that because I'm quite aware of the time constraint. Just for uh, just uh, uh, valid reason. I the elite dimension, the famous poet Omar Khayyam, in his Rubayati Omar Khayyam, he is saying to drink wine and to be happy is my religion. And when the ulama shouted at him, he said, no, I am speaking about a different sort of a wine. If you look at my wine cup from 90 degree angle, the handle of the wine cup resembles the letter Alif, Alif for Allah. 
so this is spiritual intoxication uh, this is the improvising nature of the mending mystics he was a versatile genius omar khayyam so he encountered the crisis created by the very violent very aggressive ulama by saying there's no uh, there's a creative there's a creative element spiritual element uh, attached to my concept of wine my definition of wine so he uh, could save the day by just um, um, uttering that uh, couplet uh, by uh, and by focusing on the spiritual implication of that cu couplet similarly uh, there are medicinal qualities in many uh, persian texts uh, used by the sufis for example i can mention sheik sadi sirazi who never came to india but his poetry and his writings did uh, mm -hmm. like gulistan and bostan came to india and became very popular so sadi used to say khurdan barai jistan jistan barai khurdan nist that is uh, uh, i eat i eat for my survival and not the vice versa uh, i eat only for my survival and not the vice versa this is the aristotelian philosophy the uh, translated into practice by the sufi oriented uh, scholars like uh, sadi shirazi uh, he is saying that prevention is better than cure he is saying that prevention is better than cure so in this way uh, uh, whether it's it's a question of health or whether it's a, men, a question of mental faculty uh, the sufis acted as uh, healers in uh, pre industrial south asian society nizamuddin auliya had this deep respect for his mother he used to say walida mara ba khuda taala asnae bud my mother was the way towards the kingdom of god so in this way when there was a crisis in the external masculine world they they sought refuge in the feminine spiritual internal world so uh, and you have to understand that uh, nizamuddin auliya came to india uh, with uh, his mother uh, and his he, nizamuddin auliya was a turk so was his mother and among some of the turkish tribes matriarchy is very powerful matriarchal system is very powerful so when as bibi zuleikha the mother of uh, nizamuddin auliya came to india sultana razia was ruling and razia was also a turk so uh, this is quite common among some of the turkish tribes as i have mentioned so this is the gender dimension very important among the uh, sufis who had some uh, turkish lineage that is my argument the devotees of raushan bibi of bengal Uh, have built a beautiful darga as a mark of their devotion and uh, the trustee of the darga have kept the place very neat and clean and incense is also burnt regularly at the darga so this uh, this is the healing quality in everyday life you may be a failure but you take uh, refuge uh, within the peace and solace of the darga of raushan bibi in bengal so uh, they offer flowers for spiritual spiritual solace they offer flowers fruits and sweets at the darga as minnat or manot every year in the bengali month of chaitra urs or death anniversary is celebrated here with much enthusiasm on this occasion a fair is also held here which which uh, lasts for nearly 10 days more than 1 lakh people visit this fair and they are entertained by the bandsmen kawal singers and the night sky beautifully decorated with fireworks so this is a form of respite from the everyday competitive world everyday uh, story everyday saga of failure and competition and stress so this is a, a refuge refuge is sought at the darga of the sufi shrine and sometimes at the sufi shrine of a female sufi like raushanala of bengal so uh, in this way i i i know the time is ticking out for me i i will just wind up by highlighting certain important points Uh, so what i am trying to say is that comparative uh, theology is very important in 21st century crisis the crisis we are facing in south asia and paris beyond it is a well known fact that mian mir was a sufi saint who laid the foundation stone of harmandir sahib of the sheikhs so there was exchange theological exchange between different religious sects the sheikhs the sufis the hindus and the muslims and others they exchanged ideas in this way so this is very much important so when there was tension in the external world the sheikhs were fighting the moguls in the battlefield in a pitched battle in a guerrilla warfare they were taking refuge in the shrine of sufi mian mir and allowed sufi mian mir to lay the foundation stone of harmandi sahab of the sheikhs so there was uh, there was competition at the political level at the mundane materialistic level but there was collaboration at the spiritual level that is the important dimension which we have to understand uh, so 
Jahanara, the, uh, imp- the uh, Mughal uh, princess, the daughter of Shah Jahan, uh, was, was a great scholar. And she was initiated into Sufism and wrote a book. I am not elaborating. I am just saying that she wrote a book, Munisul Arwa. If I translate that into English, it will be comforter of souls. In this way, female Sufis and female scholars emerged in the pre-industrial societies, pre-modern societies as the comforter of souls. So the feminine dimension is very important. I draw your attention to this to this fact. Uh, I'm winding up and now let us come to the colonial period. The Baul Fakirs of Bengal were considered as folk doctors, as folk doctors and Baul trace their origin from the Chisti Sufis. Uh, by the rural uh, rural people considered them as folk doctors and they had uh, knowledge about medicinal herbs and plants in the in the bengal countryside it was believed that these ambulatory mendicant singers had knowledge about these indigenous medicinal plants and were familiar with other forms of healing uh, under tantric yogic and sahojiya buddhist influence they put emphasis uh, on the human body which is the abode of god and where pilgrimage can be performed. That is, pilgrimage can be performed from the human body. Uh, this is cost-effective, user-friendly pilgrimage or the alternative pilgrimage from the perspective of the rural poor. The rural poor can perform the pilgrimage that is expensive. They can travel to the distant land. For them, there is a user-friendly mode of pilgrimage that can be performed within the human body. So this sort of adjustment had been made by the bowels who came to the rescue of the rural people who could not afford to perform the Hajj in a, in a distant place. Uh, and, and Hajj is also very expensive. So this emphasis on the human body uh, ensures the longevity of Lalon Shah, who would live for 120 years in spite of being attacked by smallpox during his youth, while his contemporary Raja Ramun Roy would die a premature death because of the tensions associated with the urban existence in Kolkata. Lalon Fokke's songs and philosophy had healing properties. So the rural peasant appears with a smiling face in spite of sliding into the death trap spread by the Mohajan in the Bengal countryside. That is why the Murshids and the Marifati singers were not merely acting as folk philosophers, but they also played the role of folk psychiatrists. Sufi Nizamuddin Aulia or Bulle Shah's familiarity with certain yogic practices is well known. They tried to reconcile the spiritual quest of their clients with the challenges of turbulent times. Uh, so it is not surprising that after being deprived of privilege, prestige, and power, the celebrated court historian Ziauddin Barani had to take shelter in the Syrian lodge of Nizamuddin Aulia. Contrarily, the tremendous material success of poet Amir, Amir Khosru also left a void which could only be filled up by his spiritual mentor Nizamuddin Aulia. The present paper aimed at studying how the Murshids tried to offer peace solace and self-confidence uh, to their clients and followers during uh, their perennial quest for identity. You have been listening for me, uh, listening to me for quite some time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We are really, really impressed and uh, it is a very uh, thoughtful uh, you know, uh, uh, lecture. Na, he, na, you established that uh, directly uh, that how the uh, Nushids and Marfati singers act as uh, folk philosophers and uh, folk psychiatrists at the same time. Uh, as we all uh, know, the effect and influence of songs and philosophy of uh, Lalan Poki uh, on Rabindranath Tagore. Yeah. Uh, he explained that how these songs uh, healed the poor uh, peasants of Bengal and uh, helped them to overcome all the uh, sufferings. Yeah. And this is uh, also important uh, yeah. you know, issue. Sure. So uh, I cannot uh, see here any question from the audience. Uh, I have one question uh, yeah. from your lecture uh, that Please. I just want to share. That uh, uh, you uh, told that uh, that uh, you uh, abstract that uh, the tantric yogis and uh, the Shahojiya Buddhist from uh, tantric yogis and Shahojiya Buddhist, uh, the um, uh, Sufis are influenced uh, uh, about the uh, uh, human body. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
is is it uh, that or uh, from the folk traditions uh, uh, the folk philosophers uh, the yogis and the shaujya buddhist were influenced uh, it is vice versa uh, or uh, so what is your opinion uh, yeah uh, thank you uh, dr sharmishta devasu for your query actually you know uh, we have to take a larger canvas canvas for our understanding of this process uh, for example starting from punjab uh, down to bengal you will find ambulatory yogis yogis used to move from one place to another so tantric uh, shaujya buddhist ideas which uh, uh, got mixed up with this sort of yogic ideas in north north western india upper india and uh, sometimes they came back to bengal and spread such ideas and they had interactions with uh, this 19th century baul fakirs and others of course but i am concentrating on the baul fakirs so that's why the baul fakirs uh, in a very pragmatic way put emphasis on the body that is you, that is you need not go to kashi brindavan or to makkah modina yeah. for uh, to perform hajj or to perform yeah. perform pilgrimage you can perform pilgrimage uh, on uh, in your own body because uh, if you carefully search your body you will find god in your body yourself actually yeah. uh, this is very significant because i did not get the time to elaborate because uh, this is integral to the identity formation process of the rural people very much important because rural people are not uh, sharing the culture of calcutta or the urban pockets of bengal but uh, okay. they are being provided with a philosophical outlook uh, which uh, convinces them that they were uh, not uh, riff raff people they were also very important and without the help of the uh, the religious mediators like the mullahs or the brahmins or the purohits they can become a part of the spiritual process by yeah. uh, sanctifying their body so this is a form of uh, form of pre industrial uh, individualism i would say this has nothing to do with individualism or uh, 18th century uh, enlightenment yeah. or something like that this is folk folk individualism so the yeah. folk people okay. uh, derive inspiration from the tantric buddhist or the yogis who came to uh, that's why the yogis put so much emphasis on the preservation of the human body that's why yeah. there is a joke that lalon shah lived for 120 years but uh, ramon roy yeah. had had a tension prone life in kolkata so died rather prematurely <laughs> so yeah. so uh, these sort of things are there um, yeah. uh, definitely there are ex- exchanges but uh, i do not have any evidence to prove that uh, the yogis or the shaujya uh, buddhist or tantric uh, buddhist or tantric yogis were influenced by the bauls because the bauls were influenced by other religious practices no doubt but they had their different path that is the mystical mystical path and that is the there is also a cultural path and that that path is quite different from the tantric uh, shaujyas or the yogis that's why lalon shah would be saying apan sadhana katha na kohiyo jotha tatha that distinguishes the bauls from the tantric yogis and others but uh, there is give and take give and take but i can only demonstrate that the bauls were influenced by that but i cannot demonstrate how uh, it took place the other way around thank you for a very pertinent question and one question from uh, dr shankar mode that uh, sir can one locate any regional differences between the approaches of sufi healers in bengal and other parts of india uh, regional difference uh, between the sufis concerning what Con- concerning what that is not uh, mentioned here sufi healers in bengal and other oh, parts okay, of okay okay yeah 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 no uh, actually you know it's a good question i i would not say i would not put uh, uh yeah yeah difference is there very very good question for example i i'll be very brief and uh, prompt in my response because of the time shortage uh, time constraint for example if you look at northern india actually our uh, researches are northern india centric so if you look at the musical instruments used by the sufis in northern india and the musical instruments used by the uh, mystics of bengal they are quite different for example ektara is used by the bauls you will not find that the north indian sufis are using ektara 
or the hyderabadi sufis are using ektara for example the uh, north indian sufis used marcia which is a which is a, which is an urdu song but the bengali sufis will use jari song which is quite different and sometimes it's a seasonal seasonal song that is very much um, familiar with the bengali environment not with the northern environment that is one point and uh, again i would say that we should not put much emphasis on the geographical variation so far as differences are concerned you can put emphasis on the uh, resources available to the sufis so far as differences are conditioned by the availability of resources that is number one number two is that differences uh, different differences can be observed if you look at the attitude of the silsilas silsilas for example the naxbundi silsilas have a different attitude as compared to the chistis or the surawardis so if, if you look at the differences among the silsilas or differences among the sufis uh, according to their available resources you will be able to find out some differences as i have mentioned because the bengali folk singers were not at all rich that's why they were forced to use a very cheap musical instrument like ektara but there is a symbolic and significance of ektara i do not have the time to uh, go into that but if you give me time i would have loved to uh, delve deep into that symbolic significance of ektara a little bit more uh, thank you shantanu for your question thank you sir uh, yeah. for today we are uh, um, just uh, stop here and uh, go to the next session and thank you for your lecture thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir and ma'am for this educational session we had moving on to the second session for today thank you we are having as moderator uh, dr devasu and, and our honorable speaker is uh, ms professor shilpa cheda ma'am please take over and introduce our speaker thank you welcome ma'am thank you uh, uh professor silpa cheda is the curator from account uh, associate assistant heritage institute of indian history and culture st javier's college mumbai coordinator diploma course in conservation and preservation of material culture heritage institute of indian history and culture st javier's college mumbai she is also course coordinator jo uh, genealogy certificate and diploma course department of philosophy university of mumbai and she is also course coordinator indian aesthetic certificate course department of philosophy university of mumbai Welcome, Professor Cheda, for your lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basu. Before starting the talk, I would like to thank Bhakti Vedant Research Center and Kolkata Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for providing me this opportunity to share my views on uh, spirituality and stress management from the Jaina perspective. i am not yet uh, a doc doctorate or a professor but uh, whatever i know uh, since 24 years i have been teaching uh, as a visiting faculty i will be sharing my knowledge and i thank uh, dr rudra dr dey and dr goswami and dr basu for inviting me and considering me eligible for giving this talk so when we talk my topic is uh, spirituality and uh, stress management uh, jain a perspective so whenever we talk about spirituality it is something inherent and it is something like very intrinsic human capacity which uh, guides the person to achieve the supreme goal since it is more affiliated to religion and philosophy and as far as india is concerned religion and philosophy always go hand in hand in the development and also the art so when we look at spirituality it is the quality of soul which gives courage to overcome the negative elements and develop a sense of serenity within and in the surroundings 
So it is considered as a very, very uh, valuable religious ethical principle, which all of us in more or less quantity quality, we all possess. It is well known fact that religion is oriented to spiritual aspects and that shapes its rituals and practices. But what is more important is that any religion focuses more on the spiritual aspect. And that is the core principle which we are going to focus today. And Jainism, of course, is not an exception in this. According to Jainism, spirituality will shape the beliefs, practices. And as it belongs to Shamana tradition of Indian uh, tradition, it focuses on Shrama, effort. What kind of effort you have to put so that your life is shaped in a particular way of life and how you have to, the meaning of the word Shrama itself suggests as far as Jainism and Buddhism are concerned, that effort is required from the human side. And this is not an ordinary path. It is a very, very strict order as far as uh, the practices are concerned and that shapes our spiritual aspect. So looking at Jaina spirituality, the highest goal is attainment of supreme bliss whom different religions call by different names. In Jainism, we call the state of Nirvan where we don't take birth again. So it is a state of complete cessation of birth and death that is ending the cycle of transmigration and reaching the state from where there is no rebirth. And in this case, when you look at the rules and regulations, we find two kind, two sets of ethical religious principles. One is for the people who have renounced the world, who are called as a Shramana Shramani or monks and nuns. And one is for the lay people who are called as Shravakas and Shravikas in Jaina tradition. When we look at religion and the ancient history and the study of scriptures, as far as scriptures go, everywhere it has been mentioned that everywhere person goes through every mode of life, but ultimately where he finds the supreme bliss. It is only when he accomplishes all the tasks and there are nothing, there are no desires, no wishes to be accomplished. And this will be the state of Nirvana or Nibbana or Moksha, liberation, annihilation. And this is more really related to theory of karma. So if you entangle the karma, you have to go on taking rebirth until you satisfy or annihilate all the karmas. In Jainism, this theory of karma governs the individual actions and how he entangles himself into these karmas and how he comes out of this uh, the entire cycle. So the Jaina metaphysical theory and the epistemological approach is more affiliated to this particular path which shapes the ethical principles. In today's world we see there is a lot of competition, we are surrounded by numerous problems and in spite of uh, technological advancements, scientific uh, revolution, we find that so many, our life has become very easy. If you look at the life of our ancestors, they had to do hard work. And today we are using lots of machines. We can fly, we can catch up with the time. But why still we are not satisfied? This entire technological advancement, why every day we are becoming more and more prone to stress, to disease, to competition. Why we are facing these kind of negativities in life? Instead of becoming a better person, we are going to a stage, we are entering into a stage where life 
life is more governed by the machines the life is more governed by the technological revolution and the contact with the nature is lost while we are encountering all this problems what is the cause what is the root of this entire vicious circle because today we are in this vicious circle if you want you have to work hard and for working hard you have to do lots of uh, things which are ethically not right there are many many desires there is no end to desires there is no end to the wishes the lust greed anger we are entering into the world where we are facing this problem every moment even if you ask a child he will say oh i am very tense because my homework is not done or my assignments are not done my projects are not done isn't this becoming a world where we are putting a child into competition why can't children play at the age where they have to do some creativity we agree but we are putting them into the stage of competition wherein they have to be best in every every aspect of life is it possible that one person is given too many tasks and he will accomplish all those tasks so from the childhood today we see parents expect so much the child has to play in that tender age where he has to be more creative where he has to contemplate a lot and come up with his own ideas today we are putting them into the uh, skill oriented world which has lots of lots of uh, assignments and uh, workload which is not expected at that age but we are looking on this scenario and we want everybody to be in that field no parent will understand that according to the age automatically children will gain some kind of art or skill and they will develop later as the age as they grow up but this kind of understanding and this kind of survival is becoming a big question so we are gifted with faculty of mind as a human being we are gifted with rationality thinking capacity but in this world we are not thinking we are just moving with the technology so mind is occupied with more this kind of technical revolution the contact with the nature we always used to establish we we were surrounded by fields we were surrounded by trees today we are surrounded by the lofty cement structures so how we are going to rejoice the nature which earlier we used to do in this growing stage we are not able to combat this and therefore there is lot of stress in life if not for ourselves we go on planning for the family and for the family the wants are never never ending we go on increasing if we have one thing we want another and this is putting us into the vicious circle so when we want to overcome this conflict and uh, we want to end this it is becoming very difficult to do but the, our ancient scriptures our ancient thought process has answers for all this and jainism advocates the philosophy of ahimsa it governs the entire philosophy so i'll be just talking about the three key concepts which are very important as far as jaina religion is concerned and jaina spiritual path is concerned number one is ahimsa now ahimsa is of course in india all the three religious traditions jainism buddhism hinduism sikhism all the four major religions of the world advocate ahimsa for that matter even the religions of the world judaism christianity zoroastrianism islam all advocate ahimsa 
all great religious reformers teachers preceptors prophets all have told to live in peace to spread love to be compassionate these are all the basic human values but why we are not touched by them what is the reason we are going away from these values today we are not compassionate we are competitive we are destructive what is the reason behind this and why we are not pondering over the constructive activity we are becoming more and more destructive the only reason is we are not doing constructive work and the competition has led to all this vicious circle so here when i discuss the ahimsa in context of uh, jainism i would like to stress that uh, in jainism it is said that one sense being like air fire water earth space akash these are all one sense beings and unless and until we respect these one sense being it says there are five sense beings we this we divide or we classify living beings into five sense beings one sense being two sense being three four five and five sense plus mind that is rationality so until and unless we say one sense being two and three is a must but the basic things which we require for our living like air without air we cannot survive without water we cannot survive without land we cannot survive without space we cannot be accommodated anywhere so we are using this one sense being and we are killing constantly this one sense being every day now this cannot be avoided because this is our sheer survival uh, the question of, of sheer survival is on that and therefore it cannot be avoided but what we can do is reduce the killing so limit the wastage of water limit the wastage of plantation grow more and more plants do not harm them these are the basic environmental features use less and less vehicles do not be the cause of producing pollution and the basic elements of nature what we call panch mahabhutas in indian tradition these panch mahabhutas are to be saved this is our priority right and in jainism the more stress is placed on saving this one sense being therefore the entire diet is to control with one sense being anything with two senses are not to be part of the jaina diet but to avoid even one sense beings and use minimum as far as possible is considered to be the highest virtue secondly through mind body and speech we should not kill thirdly we should not do oneself not allow others to do and not be the cause so in nine ways we have to constantly look how the vow of ahimsa can be followed for the monks and nuns it is very strict whereas for lay people there are certain laws where there is relaxation because they are engaged in the mundane world but one has to constantly contemplate as far as uh, the lay life also is concerned that we should not be part of harming this environment because of environment we are surviving because of water air we are there if there is drought if there is the shortage of water if there is shortage and there is a lot of contamination in air what will happen to our own survival and this is like protecting the ecosystem because we are dependent on each other so the cycle of food chain one sense will depend on two sense three sense four sense five sense whereas the five sense will depend on one sense being and this goes on this is the natural cycle 
one which cannot be avoided. And therefore, minutely, the Jainavas teach us that you have to follow the Vrata of Ahimsa, which is very, very subtle to the subtle level. And every day we have to contemplate and pray that for our mere survival, how much loss we are doing to the world, the amount of food we are wasting, there are lots of things which are not required and we are using. If we contemplate a little bit on such things and avoid every individual, if we look at the individual level and if we be little bit considerate, then we can save our environment. Still, we are not in that position. Today's scenario of Corona has taught us many, many things. The consumption of sattvic ahara, the consumption of not eating the leftover food, the stale food. These kind of diseases are explaining us. But all this ancient wisdom has taught us. We have been growing in that environment where we never had refrigerators and we never had the food which was excess, which was waste and which was kept. But in today's world, our entire cuisine has changed, which has affected our mental health, our physical health. Because it is said, ahara, achara, vichara are always connected. The way we eat our food, it connects to our behavior and even our thinking. And therefore, one has to now think, contemplate. And this should be at individual level. We say that everybody has to do but we cannot change the world we have to change ourselves and when we will change the change will be everywhere every family every every member of the society if we think in this way then definitely we are going to bring a change the second concept is a parigraha non-possession non-possession is actually linked to ahimsa non-violence Murcha Parigraha. It is defined in Jaina scriptures that Murcha is Parigraha. To be attached to the possession is what we call Parigraha. And therefore, too much clinging on the material world, on the material aspect of the world, on the material things available in the world is what is called possession and this has to be controlled because invariably it is supported by violence the more we need more we want we will do all all varieties of himsa all unnatural means of things because the wishes are so strong they are so mentally oriented that person cannot think and he goes for the destructive tendencies. Today, the rates of suicides, when you look at the world, the ancient system of joint families used to give protection, but the nuclear families, when you are looking at the possession in this sense, because one of the thing is of uh, the aspect of possession is the way we live together, the way we minimize our things, because in same electricity, the whole house will survive. When you have a separate living nuclear family system, there are many, many things. The possession increases, the competition increases, and the expenses increases. So a parigraha at every level has to control the wishes and desires and if we are able to earn a decent life, there is no harm. But for that, when you do extra work and you enter into corruption, robbery, stealing, things like that, all the negative tendencies enter. And we see that uh, today it is like the survival of the best. The jobs are limited. People always aspire for the highest. Nobody wants to work at the lower level. But it is not possible. According to the capacity people get, this 
run for the best, the highest, is killing our own survival. And the main cause for this is our possessions. If we limit our possessions, it's not that we should avoid, but use what is necessary. Whatever we are saving out of that, if we spend, then we are relaxed. Now, these all are the causes of tension because we are using more and we don't have. The raw materials are limited and the wants are ever, ever hungry. So there is no balance in the society. And to restore this balance, it is the individual effort which we have to consider. The third point is Anekantavad. And this is more at the rational level, logical level. The theory which says that reality is many-sided. And if we want to comprehend reality, one has to broaden the vision and accept others' view. You are right from your perspective, but others are also not wrong from their perspective. So if you respect, if you give honor to others, you will also get the same honor. So when we are looking at Anekanta Vada, the theory which uh, always says that every aspect of truth can be comprehended from different angles. And therefore, to know the reality in totality will be to comprehend it from all, all perspectives. When we change our perspective, we can understand other better. And this will make us a better person. And there are n number of examples when we look at people who were our seers, who are our leaders, how they have fought, how they have done for the cause of nation and for the cause of society. We have so many reformers, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, Sri Rabindranath Tagore, Jyotiba Phule, and n number of philosophers, modern philosophers, who have been fighting for these cause of equality, of brotherhood, universal love, humanity. These all qualities, how, why we are forgetting, why we are not contemplating on all this is only because of one thing which I can see is the immense, immense impact of science on human mind. Every, every person you ask wants a rational answer. Now, is this possible? And the science is governing us so much that religious principles are also questioned. When we don't understand, we say, no, science has not yet not proved. But science always says it is here and now. So technological advancement has not solved our problems. We are entering into more and more vicious problems. Why? If in this world where everything is available with the spur of a second, still why we are not happy? What is the reason for all these quick changes, advancements, and where the happiness is lost? So it is, the answer is in spirituality. Until and unless we practice the common vows, the human values, the ethical principles of compassion, love, humanity, modesty, honesty, these are the vows which will make a better person. It is always good to be in race with time, but we should not dictate nature in this process. Today we are dictating nature. Today we are governing nature. We are going against the laws of nature, which Jainism says these are all living beings. And we are putting all this into disharmony. We are breaking the cycle of their natural processes. The human being has become destructive rather than constructive. To be in harmony, they have started dictating the nature. If they should have been in harmony with nature. But now we are dictating it. 
So what is causing all this is we are not understanding. We have lost our sensitivity. We have lost touch with our own natural habitat. And when we are losing this contact, it is very important emotional contact in life. It is said that how we feel and we feel that we should never be hurt. We should never be tortured. We want peace. Others also want. And when you think what you want, you should give it to others. You will be always at peace. You will never regret in life because when you look in the surrounding, there is happiness. You also feel happy. Today, when we see death because of coronavirus, we also feel sad because we experience that next person can be us. You never know. So when we are looking at the environment, when we give happiness, we will get happiness. That is the basic concept which all the religious tradition says. It is the basic theory of karma. It says when you sow the seeds, you will ripe the fruit. But in spite of all these, why aren't we learning? Why aren't we following? The basic things is where have the ethics gone? Where have this spiritual aspects gone? Why we are so much dominated by reason? Where our touch, the contact, the sparsha has gone? We were so, so emotional. And when we look at the history of India, we see so many events where people have given their lives. The very, very survival of our nature is because today we are in this country because we have so many leaders who have saved us, so many philanthropists who have given us all these virtues. But why we are not adhering? So the main thing which I want to say here, we know everything, but we don't want to practice. We are losing on these rationalities, these discussions. We are becoming destructive because we are not constructive. If we become constructive, we become compassionate, we can touch, we can really feel what the other person is undergoing, what the entire environmental hazards are. We are losing this touch. And when we appreciate all this, we will be in harmony with nature. And as we will be happy. Our surroundings also, we will spread happiness. If we are stressful, how we will enhance this in others? This entire world of wishes and desires, there's no harm in having wishes. There's no harm. But this overuse of things, upayoga, or what we call again and again doing things where there is no end if you get you want more if you get that more you want still higher so this is not ending what is in jainism called bhoga upabhoga till bhoga it is fine or what is called in buddhism trishna this trishna is never ending and this upadana is going on so bhoga is fine because all of us need we need food we need air we need water and we consume that but when it becomes excess when we are doing it again and again whatever is not required we are spoiling that we are harming that which is not required can be avoided if we avoid at individual level all of us can avoid and this is nothing to do with uh, any pertaining to any religion or and Jainism only, all the religions of the world say this, that we have to be practicing the virtues which are given by our seers, our rishis, our prophets, who have been again and again telling us over the years they have been explaining us. And if we follow those simple virtues, it is simplicity which is required now 
it is a touch with the nature which is required now and this is the way we can achieve harmony and live a beautiful life with the beautiful surrounding thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am for your great lecture and thank you. Uh, from your lecture uh, it is uh, highlighted that uh, yeah. uh, aban abandonment or basic uh, is the basic orientation of jainism and uh, yeah. uh, the original tradition uh, of self control and uh, spiritual development uh, through yeah. a path of peace is the main goal of the of the program yes. and uh, you told us that uh, we have the we have to respect each other and we can understand uh, other better through the anekantoba and uh, yes. immense uh, you uh, you also told that immense impact of science and uh, human on the human mind uh is the cause of our uh, tension and technology cannot make us happy it can uh, support us and uh, yes. we are going uh, against the laws of nature and uh, so for uh, for this uh, lecture now we uh, just uh, suggest uh, you that uh, uh, this is a uh, this is our uh, very good advice for you know, for our social, social um, structure and there is a question in the, yeah. in the chat box uh, yeah dr shankar yeah, asked you that yeah. Uh, you, yeah, yeah yeah i will just uh, refer to that, that answer i will answer that the vow of salekhna sir is very very misunderstood mm -hmm. vow and uh, uh, it is uh, taken for minimum 6 months and maximum 12 years and what you normally see in the society uh, it is when the death is approaching they stop eating and therefore you are uh, thinning your body and then finally the death comes but actually the vow of salekhana is taken by controlling your passions first thing is you control your passions and slowly slowly control your food and this is the process of 12 long years it's not just 2 to 3 months when the death is approaching now these are certain misunderstood concepts where we say that uh, there is contradiction there is no contradiction it is like when you know the death is approaching for example you have some terminal illnesses like cancer or something and you stop taking meditation uh, medicine so when medication is stopped your body and your food intake decreases day by day automatically the body becomes thin and without food you don't survive but this cannot be taken on your own there has to be a permission from higher authority and if they consider that you have practiced certain great virtues in life you have practiced and you have controlled your passions then only it is allowed so you are not allowed to kill yourself because that also is himsa this is done by controlling passions and passions play very important role as far as jainism is concerned because they say until and unless you have passions you can never attain liberation so thinning your passions is what is called sam lekhana kaya kashaya iti lekhana sal lekhana to so kaya plus kashaya kashaya means passion kaya will be thinning you are controlling your diet slowly and this control is not within 2 3 months it takes minimum 6 months where one one thing is renounced like if you are eating twice a day make it once in a day then slowly reduce the ingredients and slowly it has to be done because it is something voluntary and when you know something is wrong within the system it is then allowed otherwise it is not allowed even though it is ritual and uh, many people 
they make it like a celebration and you must have seen many possessions and many many court cases what uh, normally they do is not right but according to scriptures it is holy death only when you are controlling passions and if they look at your religious life then only the monks give that permission of controlling the passions first it is not controlling the body but passions are to be controlled and slowly slowly when you control your passions and you start meditating start meditation at every stage till the end where you select one place one asana and you see your death nearing you so this is a slow process this is though it is voluntary and you have written it is a contradiction in the ethical codes of uh, jainism but it is highly misunderstood it is uh, more religious it is more spiritual so until and unless you have attained that spirituality in within you you are not allowed to take sanlekana first of all and even nearing the death you are not allowed you are given the permission of fast Monday. If you can control, then it's fine. But stopping med medicines or uh, when you do that, it is normal like people do in euthanasia. Because if it is more painful and if there is no such cure, then what people do is slowly, slowly reduce the food and then enter into that stage. But one thing is that you are not allowed directly to do that until and unless your religious life is. showing you have that history and you have that temperament then only you are allowed therefore one has to look at passions first then control the body thank you ma'am and yeah. the other question from tindi goshami is karma huh? the uh, root cause of the uh, stress yes. i think uh, you have already uh, discussed this matter yeah karma is but uh, here it is more the passions yeah. which are covering this yeah yeah thank you ma'am uh, so we are ending this session now thank you very much for providing ma'am that was an eye opener for sure yeah because uh, she came to know and i was not acquainted with the uh, calcutta entire group of scholars we are more pertaining to mumbai and thank you very much Thank you, I'm obliged. Thank you, ma'am. Ma so, moving on to so our moving third on session, session, our moderator for the session is Dr. Tini Goswami. She is the head of department at Saint Xavier's College for History. She is also the visiting faculty of the, uh, for the Department of History of uh, Jadavpur University, and she is the coordinator of this international webinar. for us for the session we have our revenant speaker dr father david george ma'am please introduce our speaker and take over the session uh, a very good evening to all of you am i audible am i audible yeah yeah audible. yeah, yeah. Uh, a very good evening to all of you i feel blessed to be a part of this international webinar i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity Uh, to be the coordinator uh, for this event and also to moderate the session uh, before going to introduce our prestigious speaker i would like to share some thoughts of mine on this webinar i'll take just few minutes to do so the epidemics and pandemics are not a new phenomenon in the world history even in charaka samhita we found the references of epidemics the great ancient hippocratic physician also expressed their views on epidemic and endemic diseases the perception on sickness witnessed a drastic transformation in the medieval world when the body started to get the utmost priority considering the human health it was an established belief that i quote sickness was to be prevented not because health was good in itself as the ancient say because man was accountable to god for his body by the middle of the 19th century with the help of vaccination and the concerns for sanitary improvements men 
became able to win over the elements like plague, Spanish flu, and others. But the human responsibility behind the outbreak of any virulent malady became a focal point of discussion. Nowadays, during the COVID situation, all of us are passing through a very crucial time. And many of us are suffering from tremendous mental anxiety. Here, religious faith or being spiritual is playing an important role to calm our minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hope our next speaker, Dr. Father Davis George, will enlighten us in this regard with his speech on spiritual well-being and stress management, a Christian perspective. Dr. Father Davis George is the founder director of St. Aloysius Institute of Technology, Jabalpur, Madhya Pradesh. He has done his PhD in political science and published numerous books and articles. He has received a number of prestigious awards and attended Parliament of the World Religions from 7th to 13th July 2004 at Barcelona, Spain. Father, I feel privileged to introduce you and I would like to request you to kindly take over the session. Thank you. I would like to thank Bhaktivedanta Research Center and Kolkata Society for Asian Studies who are the chief organizers. I would like to thank Dr. Chini for giving me this privilege to address this August gathering. And I must appreciate and thank the eminent speakers who the last from yesterday till today, who were actually giving us a spiritual treat. And I'm a really privileged that uh, we are able to discuss, deliberate and evolve our thinking to build a better world. We are dealing with this spiritual well-being and stress management from a Christian perspective. Can we have the next slide? Please put the next slide. Yeah, I would start with the telling all of you that we are having a bigger pandemic than Corona. As we have seen today, every day in the newspaper we read people suffering from depression and people committing suicide. It has become almost an everyday affair. And we do see that depression is a common mental disorder characterized by unremitting despondent mood, which manifests with the symptoms of anhedonia, feelings of worthlessness, helplessness, and hopelessness, a decreased appetite, difficulty in concentrating on different things, and an overall low spirit. The World Health Organization currently lists depression as the fourth major cause of disability and estimates that depression will become the second leading cause of disability after heart disease by the year 2020. And that is what we are facing today. And we are realizing this, that this has come true. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Chronic anxiety and fear and stress results in increasing the hormone cortisol. All of us know this cortisol is the main hormone that is produced when there is stress and strain and which leads to so many sicknesses. And we are seen in this uh, screen 
the effects of excess cortisol to the body is ma manifold. And that is what we see in today's world. Even without Corona pandemic, this has come to stay that people are suffering from disability of, uh, of, uh, uh, of dealing with the current situation. And so we need to look into ways and means. I was listening yesterday and today, and I'm very pleased that we have uh, 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 different perspectives shared here, how to deal with this current situation. I would like now see the next slide and um, please come to the next slide. How to deal with the stress. Next slide. I just would like to begin with a short story of a professor. He took, uh, he took a glass of water in his hand and he asked, he asked, he, he asked the students in the class. How much does it weigh? And he said, you guess it between 20 grams to 200 grams. And some of them said 20 grams. Another said uh, 100 grams. Then he said 200 grams. At the end, he said, the weight of the glass is not important. What is important is how long are you going to hold this glass in your hand? If you hold it for five minutes, you may not feel anything as such. If you hold it for one hour, the hand starts paining. And if you hold it for the whole day, probably your hand will become numb and you may have to be hospitalized. What you need to do is put the glass down. And that is what we are dealing with in dealing with the stress and depression and other activities. May I have the next slide? So we, we deal with the challenges and opportunities of stress management. And we have seen people take shortcuts to deal with the stress. And we have people in today addiction to drugs, drinks and unhealthy habits and have become easy way out by leading to brokenness, loneliness and often suicide. And every day in the newspaper, we are reading this every single day. And almost the media has taken the whole country for a ride. And we have only one issue, suicide, depression, brokenness, emptiness. And we have a lot of products and programs to manage stress. Huge number of products and programs. And humankind is relentlessly searching for stress management and spiritual well-being. Looking for body, mind and soul connect. And I must say, what you all are doing today with this three days webinar is exactly the same that you are trying to resolve this conflicting situation and see whether we can find meaning in what is happening in today's world. And once again, I just would like now to invite all of you. I would like to share with you uh, from the Christian perspective. And uh, before I start this perspective, I must say every single religion Every single religion in today's world, everybody wants to promote contentment, peace, holistic way of living. So there is no, let us have no competition between one religion and the other. Every religion promotes wellness methods. So I would like to invite all of you, delegates, participants, scholars. I would like you to uh, just glance through the, the teachings of how to handle stress from a Christian perspective. May I have the next slide? I would like to begin with, Jesus Christ did not come to establish a religion which has come as Christianity. I must make you understand, Jesus did not come to establish a religion and rituals. In fact, he was a revolutionary and he was all the time against this process. He came basically to save humankind from sin, anxiety and fear. He transformed and healed the lives of all those who met him. His followers were originally known as those who belonged to the way. I would like, uh, I would like all of you to understand, somehow today Christianity has been misunderstood. It has come to mean that it is a religion and conversion, proselytization, 
course for conversion. I want to clarify to all of you. There is no such thing. This was not what was intended by Jesus Christ. Whatever aberration you see, that is not the truth. And you must understand, if you read the Bible, which is the, the, the part of, there is a part called Acts of the Apostles, you will find uh, Jesus basically uh, promoted a way of life, way of loving, forgiving, serving, praying, and building the fatherhood of God and brotherhood and sisterhood of humankind. This is in brief. Jesus came not to start a religion, but basically to, came to show how to love God and how to love one another, irrespective of religion. We just belong to one religion, the religion of humankind, humanity. Next slide, please. I just would like to share with you uh, the 10 insights from the Bible, 10 insights to manage stress. And at the very outset, I would like to say Bible is a handbook on life management. And uh, uh, we, you know, some of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. I would like to just put it in the same way. We have ten insights from the Bible. Let's say the first. I would like to uh, I would like to tell all of you the first insight from the Bible is I am unique. I am human. I am imperfect. I am work in progress. May I have the second slide? Next slide. Next slide. Yes. I am unique. I am human. I am imperfect. I am work in progress. The first basic insight the Bible would like to give all of us is that we are a unique creation of God. No duplication. And there is no question of those who belong to one religion is like this, another religion is like this. All human beings the color of the blood is the same. All human beings breathe in the same air. All human beings drink the same water in different places. All of us walk on the same earth. And yet, in every place, every human being is made as unique and human. And I am imperfect. And I am work in progress. So we, you know, many times we find that... Uh, uh, they, we have a beautiful sentence in Psalm 138. We have, you have knit me together in my mother's womb. All of us. No religion attached in this sentence. Every single human being, we are knit together in our mother's womb as a unique human being. And I have engraved, I have engraved you in the palm of my hand. Palms of my hand. Your name is written here. And I constantly remember you. Next. Uh, you are God's masterpiece. You are precious and honored in my sight. And I love you. And I love you. This is a wonderful sentence on this entire concept of uh, you are unique. You are human. You are imperfect. And your work in progress. You are precious and honored in my sight. And I love you. I think the world today needs to hear this particular sentence many, many times. No Christian, no Hindu, no Muslim, no Jain, no Parsi, no Sikh. You as a human being, you are precious and honored in my sight. And I love you. I think this will, uh, this will, uh, uh, this could promote and tell everyone. You are God's masterpiece. I had put this sentence. I had put this sentence in the college where I was principal for 19 years. This sentence. And I was amazed. Last year, a girl put her head on this particular sentence and put in the Facebook. I am, you are precious. And God loves you. And I was so deeply touched because irrespective of the religion, all of us go through stress and strain. And a sentence like this can build our entire being. Please come to the next slide. And we have in the next slide, we are the claim, you are the porter. And we are all the work of your hands. This is, I am work in progress. In these pandemic times, 
when we are confronted with the ups and downs we are con confronted with the mornings and evenings we are confronted with the struggle and challenges one after the other we need to remember that we are just clay you know i had a uh, call one uh, chief executive of a uh, uh, of a multinational company to give a talk to the staff and students here and he told me most of the time people boast and say i am self made he said i am an ex chief executive of a company but i want to tell you i am not self made i am god made that will make us humble we are the clay you are the potter and he keeps on shaping even through corona pandemic he is shaping the mankind he is building immunity system he has he is asking us to set our priorities life right next please the next uh, insight from the bible is words from the bible provides immunity and courage somehow i must say uh, over the years because of uh, uh, because of uh, the conversion and uh, proselytization or issues connected with uh, many things uh, probably people have not understood the power in god's words i have read many many stories i have seen many many people who have been touched and healed and got immunity and courage in very very challenging times only by reflecting on god's word next slide please so we have a wonderful sentence you know in matthew chapter 4 verse 4 this is again from the bible man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god again in joshua 1:8 we have let his word of god never depart from you and you will be prosperous and successful and that is what we need to remember that it's just man in with all material wealth and with all understanding and with all technological prowess we have seen that he is not happy he is not contented and that is what jesus came to say as i told you bible is a handbook for life life management you shall not live by bread alone you shall not live by money alone you shall not live by your technical prowess alone you need god's word you need uplifting words so what i would like to recommend in the second insight is believe in in god's promises and obey his words and journey from fear to faith what is like a rocking chair it will keep you busy but you won't get anywhere so we have wonderful sentences from the bible which can uplift your entire being may i have the next slide we have the third insight from the bible third next ahead yes the third insight is believe in a god who is caring for you we have a beautiful sentence cast all your worries upon him because he care, cares for you we have a beautiful sentence from matthew 11:28 come to me all those who are burdened i must again tell you jesus christ has not made any religion he has not made any distinction his invitation is call is to the entire human kind you just come come to me all those who are burdened irrespective of religion irrespective of your shortcomings irrespective of your sins irrespective of your addictions just come to me and cast throw your anxieties and fear upon me because i care for you next one next slide please we have a wonderful sentence which i have uh, i have uh, shared with many people at different times and that is uh, from again from the bible hebrews uh, chapter 13 verse 5 i will never leave you or forsake you you will be amazed to know that many people who have been strengthened just by the, repeating the sentence i will never leave you people may leave friends may break away there could be challenges in the family and you may feel utter loneliness emptiness depression here here we are god telling right now i will not leave you or forsake you 
And Jesus, in in Matthew 6, 26, he, you know, he's a great teacher, marvelous teacher, amazing teacher. He always makes use of the nature. And he said, look at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air. At least of the field. If God the Father is caring for them, how much more? And not even a hair will fall to the ground. We have wonderful promise given in Isaiah Bible. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. What I would like to say, these words are very uplifting words. And these words have got no religion. And these words are not inviting us to convert from one religion to the other. These are simple words which can uplift every single person every single day. I just would like to share with you from the 1st of May, I have been uh, doing this in my WhatsApp status. Every day I give a short message, very, very short message of uplifting message. It is on even today. I see Tini has seen that today. Some of you have seen. Maybe you can see and you will see no process of changing religion. It is just filling your soul and mind with the courage. Next, please. Next slide. It's again another side saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Next one, please. Next slide. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. Again, a reason for hope. These are all wonderful sentences. I would like to say, you want to cope up with the stress? Man does not leave by bread alone. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I invite you to spend just, it, you will have a sort of a magic, magic formula to dissolve. You will see one by one, the problems, challenges, fear, anxiety, burden, burden, they will be dissolved. Next slide, please. The fourth insight is believe in the power of prayer. Seek God and his ways. Take any religion, tell me. Any religion, we are talking about Christian perspective, but I have been in connected with the interreligious dialogue and I have seen that every single religion promotes prayer. And prayer is just being in the presence of Almighty God. There can never be 200, 300, 400 gods. Just one God. Whether he is called intelligent design as scientists Try to say whether he is called just one almighty power or you may say it's an energy, whatever it is, just one God. And our quarreling on uh, 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 our quarreling on different types of God, it is ridiculous. What is important is that we are in touch with this invisible God. We are dealing with the invisible uh, virus, this invisible spiritual power and get a recharge. Next slide, please. Next slide. So behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. And I'm not deaf, that I cannot hear. So we have a wonderful sentence which God says that I'm able to hear you. You just call on me. Next sentence. Next slide, please. Next slide. So prayer, Gandhiji says, is the, is the key to the morning and the bolt of the night. Yeah, Alfred Tennyson says, more things are wrought by prayer than this world can dream of. And we have Jesus continuously saying, do not lose heart. Do not be anxious. As long as they sought, they were prosperous and successful. Those of you who like to have God's mobile number, he is Jeremiah, is a prophet, 33.3. Simple sentence, call me and I will answer you. There is no problem of uh, there is no problem of connectivity. Uh, you're out of range. God is always in range. All what we need to do is call on Him, anyone, any place, any time. We have a wonderful serenity prayer, which has again brought great comfort and solace to many people. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. 
plug into God and get yourself recharged. Next slide, please. Learn to relax. Return, relax and rest. And we are all now in quarantine, quarantine time. Again, I, I am amazed with this sentence. It is not going to temple, not going to church, not going to Gurudwara, mosque, any place. Very simple matter of fact statement given. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. What an amazing sentence. And we are in quarantine time many times. Next sentence. Next slide. So we have many sentences from the Bible which is inviting us to come to this aspect. That is this aspect of uh, uh, being silent. So practice listening. God has given us two ears, which means we must listen more. Only one mouth. Speak less. Listen more. Practice meditation. Practice silence. Slow down and relax. Next slide, please. The next from the Bible insight is mind matters. Renew your thoughts and attitudes. Practically every religion talks this. Every single religion. Mind matters. Renew your thoughts and attitudes. A wonderful sentence. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And this is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Next slide, please. We have a, a wonderful sentence from Romans 12, 2. And, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I can do all things in Christ who strengthen me. Yes, I can. Positive thoughts, attitude counts. And that is what we need to do. Attitude counts. Next slide, please. Next slide. We have wonderful sentence, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew your strength. So basically the insight is you need to renew your strength and call upon, wait upon God. Next slide, please. The second, seventh is practice gratitude. The easiest way to get back to state of happiness is to practice gratitude. You need to practice gratitude to get back to happiness. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes. Count your blessing every day. I have taught in many places. Five mantras. First mantra is you get, a, oh my God, I am alive. What an awesome day. I'm looking great. Today is my day. I can do all things in God who strengthens me. The seven wonders a child wrote is not the pyramids of Egypt. He said, I can breathe. I can hear. I can see. I can taste. I can touch. I can love. I can laugh. Seven wonders. So let us remain cheerful and happy all the time. Next, next slide, please. Eight is forgiveness is the key to stress-free life. Forgiveness is unlocking the door uh, to set someone free and realizing you are the prisoner. You see, most of the cause for tension is unforgiving attitude. Let us really let go. Just now I was listening to the talk from Jay's perspective, Ahimsa. Let, not, let go. Let us not get stuck with retaliation, revenge. Next slide, please. So forgiveness is man's deepest need and greatest achievement. Learn to forgive. Let go of anger, resentment. Free yourself by forgiving and moving on. Keeping grudge and taking revenge will destroy oneself. And that is the one of the biggest teaching of Jesus is, is forgive. And on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And this is if you put this into practice, I think half the stress will be over and the healing will take place right then when we start forgiving. Next slide. Next slide, please. So do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. I think in the world today and India today, India today, we need to practice forgiveness. No use, I am praying, I am going to temple, church, gurudwara, mosque, and we keep grudge. 
just no use absolutely no use families are broken relationships are destroyed friendships have gone away only because we keep grudge let us practice for giving us to have a stress free life next slide and the ninth one is practice love to experience peace of mind i think love is the source love is the core love is the summit of every religion what a wonderful sentence we have people think love is just infatuation romance no love is a verb which would mean love is patient love is kind it does not envy does not boast it is not proud it does not dishonor so it is a practical way of living if i say i love and i hate if i say i love i don't i am not kind many times we are not kind to each other we are jealous envious and we are loving god impossible next slide next slide next slide please my commandment is this love each other as i have loved you you see jesus did not again say he did not come to make a religion his only commandment was love each other as i have loved you he was asked how much do you love me he stretched out his hands on the cross and said this much next next slide i i like rumi it's a great mystic he says my religion is love every heart is my temple and we have from the bible again a sentence god is love and he who abides in love abides in god and god in him if you ask me just one thing every religion should converge on let us build a culture of love civilization of love and get rid of hatred half this corona and so on is not a major issue not a major issue it can be resolved last one last slide next point we have we have next one overcome fear with the faith and trust in god fear is the is a bigger pandemic then corona virus be strong and courageous do not be afraid do not be discouraged for the lord your god will be with you what is important is that we trust and we allow god to take charge of us next slide next slide please so we have a 365 times it is written fear not i am with you do not fret but trust and do good next slide next yeah we we will find up we will not now we can do what i would like to say explore new frontiers in stress management stress manage from god to god go from religion rituality to spirituality and humanity focus on holistic development focus on your head focus on your heart focus on your hands your skills and your habits and let us not talk and compete with each other on religion and rituals next slide i would like to conclude with this uh, last slide last slide please next slide please i would like to conclude and say god's way of managing stress jesus came to show human kind how to overcome fear and anxiety and lead a life of contentment and peace he taught people to have faith and trust in god's providence and practice forgiveness love humility and integrity he encouraged people to go from the outward appearance of religion to the inside practice of it from the external to the internal from religion to spirituality life and teachings of jesus christ could be life challenging life changing for spiritual health and mental well being thank you so much i appreciate the time a great privilege to address all of you thank you father thank you for your presentation you have aptly described the various techniques of stress management with special emphasis on christianity especially decoding bible as the handbook of mindfulness you have explained the essence of christianity where love pity compassion and kindness are the four pillars of wisdom you have rightly pointed out the worth of us irrespective of caste class gender and creed your lecture will surely empower us with new hopes or aspirations and the positive vibes of prayer and 
forgiveness. We have one question for you, Father. It's from yeah. Dr. Shantanu Dev. So I just read the question for you. So, Father, to what extent do you consider interfaith dialogue and academic study of religious studies courses have a role to play in India, not just in COVID times, but also in 21st century in general? Excellent, excellent question. And I would think this is the only panacea. The only panacea in today's world, we have pluralist, pluralistic world, different religions. And when we start, now I was listening to the talk on Sufism, on Fatima, on Jainism. You see, when we understand, we need to promote interreligious dialogue. And let us let us not talk about the differences. Let us talk about on the commonality on which we have no differences at all. We believe spirituality is common. We believe humility is common. We believe holiness is common. We believe prayer is common. We believe uh, uh, service is common. Look for things and let us look for great role models in every religion who has practiced their religion. Like Mother Teresa is a very, very visible sign of Christianity. So I would strongly recommend your this, uh, both the groups I would uh, think um, Bhakti Vedanta and Kolkata Society, you could uh, take it up and we could really play a very proactive role. Yes, Father, I also uh, think the same because Jesus Christ, he claimed himself as the child of God. He didn't preach any religion when he started talking about the, the spread of love and kindness to all. That time he didn't utter that he was preaching any particular religion. Rather, he was giving emphasis on commonness uh, uh, and also to some kind of uh, common bond or like a common passion for love and for pity uh, for all. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I would also like to thank Bhakti Vedanta Research <coughs> Center and Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for giving me this opportunity to moderate this section. Thank you so much. Thanks to all. Uh, we have one more question if we can take the question father uh, so with your permission uh, this question is by sutapa sadhu uh, what uh, is uh, it's an observation uh, i find teachings of christ similar to the teachings of gita how do we relate the teachings of gita and bible to enforce in this time so, Father, can you hear me? There is one more question for you by Sutapa Sadhu. So, yes, Father, can you hear me? So, Father is typing uh, the answer in the chat box. Yes, Gita and the Bible, they have similarity while preaching the religious ideas. So, uh, from that perspective, both these religious texts are sharing same notes. Thank you. That was very enlightening, Father. Moving on to our final session for today, we have as moderator, Sheikh Makbul Islam. He has been the director of Jagannath Research Center and an associate professor of department of Bengali at St. Paul's Cathedral College, Kolkata. And as uh, for our speaker, we have Dr. Payali Chakravarti. Sir, please introduce ma'am and take over the session.
So first, I would like to welcome our respected speaker, Madam Piyali Chakraborty. You are most welcome, Madam, <laughs> to this session to give to to give your presentation. And uh, after listening to uh, the message from the perspective of Holy Bible and Christianity, we are going to listen another very interesting paper on stress management, a Buddhist perspective. So as we already know that uh, starting from Lord Buddha to Jesus Christ, right up to uh, Sri Chaitanya Dev and even to, Sri Rama, to the age of Sri Ramakrishna and all other respected gurus, the basic message is love. And this was also propagated by Lord Buddha. I request uh, our respected speaker, Piyali Chakraborty, Madam. Before that, I would like to introduce her. Dr. Piyali Chakraborty is a gold medalist. She is an associate assistant professor in the Department of Buddhist Studies, University of Calcutta, and guest lecturer in the Department of Languages and PGDBS in the same university, University of Calcutta. He has done her MA, MPhil, and PhD in Pali. She is also an URF University of Calcutta, GRF and SRF, UGC. She also has acquired RL Mitra Fellowship in the Asiatic Society. As you all know, it is an institution of national importance, the Asiatic Society. So I request uh, respected Madam Piyali Chakraborty to please proceed with uh, your presentation. Thank you, sir. And especially, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Bhakti Vedanta Research Center, along with Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, for giving me an opportunity to present myself here in this esteemed platform and sharing the same platform where such erudite scholars are presenting their own views. So, as my topic is path in spirituality and well being is related very, very much because Buddhism is the term we take to so synonymous brother to uh, serenity, tranquility, solace, compassion. As you can see, I was hearing uh, Dr. Father David George and Sheila Chedras. All are focusing to one thing. That is the harmony, compassion, uh, tranquility, and everything in this pandemic situation. As we are in a panic-stricken society, so we need to get something which will give us solace. So this webinar, a three-day and international webinar, is a very uh, important, uh, taking up very important issue and pertinent point in dealing with this uh, present crisis. We are really going through a very critical situation. So Buddhism, from the point of view, how to deal up with the stress is indeed a very important and very, very, uh, it has a huge manifestation. Because uh, if you look at it, that when Buddha started his first uh, as a religious preacher. His first sermon is Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. In this Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, his first uttered word is Dukkha, that is suffering. So we all are suffering. What we are suffering, we are suffering in COVID-19. It's not only that the physical ailment, we are also suffering from the social ailment, from mental ailment, that is the most important. That is the point we are discussing here in this platform. So it is very much pertinent, and I'm very much grateful to you, and I'm honored to share my view with you here. Thank you, everybody. So shall I start now? My topic is very simple, because I didn't make any fuss with my heading and all. I just make it a simple one. Trace management of Buddhist approach. If anything arises, I'm quoting from Buddha Vaz, if anything arises, it is suffering. If anything passes away, it is also suffering. Buddhism is concerned with man's existential predicaments such as loneliness, depression, anxiety, and so and so, which according to Buddhism is a problem of suffering. If Buddhism is to be understood in this context, it follows that all Buddhist teachings, whether relating to ontology, epistemology, psychology, or ethics, are ultimately related to the problem of suffering and its final solution. It is on this theme that all Buddhist teachings converge, and it is in this relation to this that they assume their significance. Trace is a kind of suffering, as we all know. But in the discourses of Buddha, I'm again quoting this in the great ocean, there's only one test. That is a taste of salt. 
So in the doctrine, in the discipline, there is only one test. That's the taste of freedom. That's freedom from suffering. The Bhimutti Rasa. Anguttara Nikaya. From there, I'm quoting it. Anyway, let's come to the stress. Stress is a suffering caused by accumulation of several problems in human life. Stress is a mental condition, as we all know that very well. So coming up to the Buddhist teaching and from where we can look into it, it has useful and varied ways to cope with this stress by calming and controlling the mind, most precisely by controlling all sorts of negative emotions, negative ideas and feelings. We think... All our situations are unique. It is a very inevitable situation that we are. We say that I'm unique because my problem is unique. I it cannot be compared with others. But it is true. This uh, this feeling is very much true. It is accepted in Buddhism. Instead of that, we think our minds are crazy and chaotic, and we can't stop it being functioning. Therefore, there's nothing we can do about it. Here, I would like to give a disclaimer that I am con confined myself or rather restricted myself to the Theravada Buddhist doctrine. Yeah, so it is uh, mainly based on the Pali canonized doctrine where we can focus on the Sutta Pitaka and I have taken only the Sutta Pitaka's middle-sized discourses named as Majjhima Nikaya. Out of the three suttas I have taken into today's discussion. So here we have found what I'm going to share with you, with you. We have tried something. Nothing has worked out for the stress management I'm talking about. Well, so we assume to think it is just how we are. You see, it is simple. We are, every day we are talking like this way. This is a universal condition we all suffer from. This condition which creates stress are same for all of us and have affected humans for thousands of years. Buddha's teachings tells us that just as there is central quality to all of our suffering, there is also a central, sorry, central cure for it as well. Stress and anxiety are no exception to that. The aim of Buddhist way of life is deliverance from suffering, and suffering is the only thing which has its root in desire. But desires are never, never satisfied. One desire satisfied, another desire comes creeping up. So how to keep ourselves at peace with that? Happiness is just an opposite to desire. If you have desire, you cannot have happiness. But what they are going to say in this with this doctrine, the happy one who is satisfied. Because we are not satisfied. One after another, we are hankering after one craving to another craving. So how to keep ourselves cool? The happy one who is satisfied. Seeks nothing, longs nothing, for nothing, wants nothing, and wills nothing also. He has found all that he seeks. Otherwise, you would not be happy. It is true. Real happiness is freedom. And it is the marrow of the backbone of all our striving. Some have wrong conception of real freedom. Many of us do not have the enough energy to follow that inclination for a higher ideal life. Though some have big idea where true happiness or true freedom can be found. True happiness or real happiness has not to be made. Everyone carries it within himself in the conviction of purity of life. If you have a pure conscience, you are a happy person. For all, desires is just an opposite to that. It circles with ego. If you have ego, you cannot be happy because ego creates a lot of issues because I want this, because it is something which gives you a pseudo-personality. Self-interest stands in the way of the realization of your ideal. The freedom from this bondage, that is the egocentric personality, is actually indicating we cannot get out of this and we are getting into it, entangled by this bondage and bondage. So we will not be able to attain the spiritual freedom. Selfishness is attachment and its source is craving. Quoting from Madhima Nikaya, doctrine number 44. Whoso have not, uh, whoso have not one thing beloved, they have no sorrow. Sorrowless are they. Passionless are they, certain are they, I declare. It is quoting from Suddha Nikaya of the Suddha Pitaka. According to Buddhism, the true Dhamma is Pachatam Veditabha Diyuhi, meaning to be realized by the wise with the temple. That is the inner, inside development or inner vision uh, practices. It is a great, it is a lifestyle. Dhamma is nothing to do with because I'm not keeping in my discussion today is anything related to Buddhist phenomenology, but it often comes. Uh, though I can find to the sutta only, sutta pitaka, but Buddhist phenomenology where the thought and the mind is often come, the chit and chitashika, the root word chit is coming from that. 
the chitta has originated. So chitta, cheta, chet is all related to mind. So if your inner soul or inner inner uh, inner vision is not created, there's no point. So another thing is that I would like to inform you in this uh, discussion, meditation. As you could see, the Buddhism is uh, just, it is an indispensable uh, wing, you can say, meditation. There are a lot of uh, meditational institutions springing up here and there from these two ways, all dealing with the Vipassana center, relating to the Samatha practices, equanimity. So this is very important in this matter in combating the stresses as we are going through. But before having the meditation, before sitting down, we need to calm ourselves. How will I? I will just explain it later. Just two, three lines on meditation because otherwise it will be incomplete. Meditation for Buddhism is a means of generating the inner understanding, request for deliverance for suffering. It produces purity of mind and clarity of vision to see the things how they are. In order to purify mind, to be free from stress and suffering, meditation renders long-lasting effects than any tranquilizer. Buddhist teachings provide useful concepts and practical ways such as breathing meditation, anapanasati, for coping with various problems that causes stress with with fear or with uh, sheer mindfulness, sorry, and consciousness. When looking at stress and anxiety, a certain recurring theme rises to the surface. With mindfulness and sitting meditation practice, we can not only release stress but can better manage our anxiety and also break the patterns of behavior which causes stress. And gradually the anxiety is, will get over in the first place and then overcome it completely in a gradual manner. The foundation of the meditative practice is to calm the mind. First of all, we have to calm the mind. If our mind is in distress, it's, it's going here and there because we always work. Even uh, I'm talking, my mind is working in three or four facets. So this is not the way we can have meditation in one fine morning. We'll get up and sit and we'll have meditation. That is not the way. First, we have to com compose my mind, have to calm down the mind and sit and think, how will I do it? First, we have to calm the mind by listening to the music, by looking, uh, reading a good book, looking at a good movie. Yes, that will also do. So this is calming procedure is very much necessary. There is no hard and first rule. First, you just sit down and just follow your breathing exercise. In Pali scripture, the practice of meditation aims at developing calm and concentrated unified state of consciousness as a means of experiencing inner peace. But though this state of mind or intellect may be convinced of this truth, on the other side, mind with all its craving, desire, attachment is slow to follow and very hard to follow this because we are full of desires, cravings and we are fond of pleasurable objects and all. So those who try to satisfy the senses under whichever forms become their slaves. As long as we have the feeling of unsatisfied desires, we place ourselves under the yoke of the material plane. Desire brings no contentment in life. It is an everlasting phenomena that suck on the inner peace of, the, of ourselves. There are a lot of references that are related to stress management. I've taken out only the three sutta. In the first sutta of the Majjhima Nikai, the sutta number 20, where I just uh, giving a panoramic view of the five way of removal of distracting thoughts. In the second uh, sutta, I will citing the three uh, nature of evil thoughts. And in the third sutta, there are 16 way or the causes of the stress. Let's come to the first sutta, Vitakka Santana Sutta. That is the removal of distracting thoughts. Sutta number 20 of the Majjhima Nikaya. First category which comes first to here is Ayya Nimitta. The Pali word is Ayya Nimitta, which means desire, anger, or delusion arises in the mind. This is very common to us. He or she has to reflect on another wholesome thought instead of ever unwholesome thoughts. These are unwholesome thoughts. According to Pali scripture, unwholesome is a crucial anger, greed, uh, lobha, we can say, delusions, uh, moho, these are all unwholesome thoughts, a crucial. The crucial thought, either you can look at some good thing which will give you a good feeling. So first, you have to uh, distinguish, differentiate the Wholesome thought or the unwholesome thought. Pushala and Adina Bhopa Parikhata. 
this is the term used for by observing the defects of the thought reaction or bad effects of this thought arises in the mind one is able to overcome the stresses in the mind asat is another factor avoiding the contemplating on unwholesome thought if some thought bring unsatisfaction inevitable suffering is obvious suffering to the mind one has to get rid of contemplating on that unwholesome thought yeah, i have to remove it it isn't very it has a tremendous force because it has a power to attract the mass so it is it is very hard to avoid but we have to uh, identify that sort of thought and get rid of it the moment i identify it i'll try but it is not a question of one day it will take time vitakka moolo veda where there is a stress there should be a cause for it so searching for the cause and observing it avoid from that stress last in this section is avinna ganhata if there is a stress or difficulty such as covetousness anger delusion as i said before that defiles the mind one has to eradicate that thought with the help of whole some thought that is the crucial it is very easy to say but hard to follow i know again another sutra where i could find the managing of the stress here they just stated three factors of the evil thought the next sutra is maha dukha khanda sutra of the madhyama nikaya it first factor it said asadista every sensual feeling or sensual pleasure has a taste of or a pleasure one has to realize that the person clinging to this sort of pleasure with a polluted mind if someone eager to pleasure uh, eager to the pleasure automatically his mind becomes stressful therefore it is good to know the nature of the pleasure first you have to identify what sort of pleasure you are going after then comes the adinava even though in this section we have the sensual thought and pleasure being the joy it has a hidden suffering in it. apparently it looks very pleasurable but it has a hidden suffering because pleasure also not forever and it is also disappears in no time as long as one understand the adinava of the pleasure he tries to overcome it in proper way third nisarana nisarana means getting rid of unsatisfaction by seeing the reality of the world one can realize that when one gets rid of the pleasure by understanding its nature is able to overcome all sort of stresses it is in the later stage that okay i've gone through it i found it this desire will not going to give me an any permanent solution it will not give me solace the temporary existence so i have to nisar and i took take nisar and from this and get out of it in the last anumana sutra that is in the re- relating to the stress management it is the sutra number 15 of the madhyama nikaya dealing with that there are 16 methods of where we can see the different uh, methods different uh, points which causes defilements or po- which pollutes the mind and create stresses in our the pali term is that number 1 papicha hoti that is being sinful and mere and having mean desire very mean i mean secondly uttu kansaka hoti despising other and thinking oneself to be supreme one and others to be in a lower to look to down others kodhana hoti getting angry is one of the reason of stresses kodo hetu upanahi being hateful is also one of the major reason for stress kodo hetu avisangi making conflict with others it creates stresses undoubtedly kodo hetu avasangi making conflicts with others as i mentioned six is kodo sammanna vachana nicharetha using bad or harsh words in cause of anger when we are angry we use very harsh words chudira chhoda kena apasa deti one does not accept one mistake that others show i do not accept my mistake now this is a typical attitude and it also creates Insulting the person who shows the mistake. This is very obvious, very common. We never accept a criticism. When someone accuses you for a mistake, the accused also re-accuses the other. When someone shows mistake, the accused try to cover by telling something for excuses. 
being answerless when someone accuses on one's mistake makki hoti palasi ungrateful and blaming others this is also very common and expressed issu ki hoti machhari enviousness and covetous satya hoti mayavi cunning and deceptive thaddo hoti ati mana callous and excessive pride also rise also give rise to stress sandipthi paramasi hoti the last one clinging on one's view without accepting others view and always right and others are wrong this attitude is indicated from sandhi ati parimasi hoti so you can see these are the things which is very much common we understand but it's very hard to implement in our life so according to buddhist teaching there are ways to manage stresses and overcome difficulties it is true that people are not satisfied with what they have and due to past unsatisfactoriness the grief they lament and become stressful so buddhism suggests different ways to control craving and unsatisfactoriness of mind so the stress automatically arises and can be controlled which can have a peaceful state of mind unless if you have this uh, method to be implemented within yourself as long as mind is filled with desire mind cannot be free from stresses mind filled with desires craving defilements is stressful mind which can never find peace and serenity now i'll give you some of the view which will help us to deal with the stresses according to buddhism there are five hindrances they are sensual desire anger sloth stupor restlessness worry i don't use i'm not using any pali words here just i'm just translating the word and doubt or reasons for stresses in mind however all this roots are starting from craving therefore if someone can rest in one mind by overcoming one's craving that becomes the way of managing stresses as per buddhism it is the one and the only way to make one's mind calm and concentrated there are a lot of religious story to prove that a lot of people came to buddha with a stressed mind to take refuge by focusing on central point especially something which has a significant effect on your state of mind and also the breathing process generated still calmness like pebble resting in the bottom of the lake will really bring the pebble settle it is a fantastic measure if you start doing this just keep yourself in a small room we just sit early morning you rise up you sit for a while and let your thought go and follow your thought where it goes at the background you can put some music or you can uh, read a book you can also do that but music really effective very much because i have practiced that identifying the harmful patterns of stress is also one of the most important in combating the stress once you have begun to calm the mind you will gradually able to identify the harmful effects of stresses and anxiety and creating patterns of behavior with your everyday mindfulness practice mindfulness is very important here because we do not do a single work mindfully we are doing something and thinking something else and mind is in so uh, compartmentalized in different section before coming the mind lot of things are happening behind the scenes what are they but you cannot detect them exactly but at least we can get some idea i have just jotted down some points so these are the following patterns which appears within the mind by uh, by following this we can have Uh, tranquility in ourselves what is it to remove all sort of obstru- obstruction conferring which conferring or hold you back from not having the clarity of the things what actually they are in this critical stage we have to follow this pattern hmm. this pattern uh, is just uh, some major points that what i feel when i am stressed that oh my god i cannot stop thinking i have so much to do i'm doing this i'm doing that but okay i have to do that i have to clear this thing i have to do this so one after another things are coming so how to do it i can't handle this i'm helpless i'm not capable of handling this this is also one of the patterns in stress as soon as i get it done i will take a break but actually break never happens this is also another factor we often see when we are in stress i am fine i'm telling myself i'll stop later but actually now right now i'm in stress but i'm fine i will manage i'm conscious being that's why i'm telling this way what if this happens okay i'm in stress let's see let 
let go with that let my mind travel in that way but what will happen again another factor which comes is that what am i going to do if this thing is let go but i'm not doing it what i'm doing okay i'm brooding this thought brooding oh god i have to do that i have to do this oh i have to manage this i have to manage that things are coming one after another these are supposed to be like this but we wish something it happens something else another factor which we face in our daily life why didn't this happen to me the way which i have wanted this is the last thing it, it, i think it is the most important thing what i wish i don't get it it's better to accept this the way how it has come down to me better accept this by identifying this harmful patterns of behavior we are halfway to cutting down the sources of stress altogether and experiencing the greatest relief but we don't do that so the only job here is to acknowledge this thought the feelings and the behavior with your mindfulness as we notice them don't read into them don't just read it just don't try just acknowledge it but in what way it arises and do not be judgmental here this may sound simple but it is often difficult and takes time patience is very important in this point on but continue practicing this consistently with more than enough motivation we have we will get a very good result be present and give yourself time to heal this is the last point once the but i will conclude here once the pattern is clear it needs time to heal continue the process because we need to have some will that is in pali called thunder we have to give some effort that no i will not think on what will happen let's see let's face it this is the effort or virya and then you investigate what will happen if i do not achieve that goal this hankering this power of uh, prowess or acquiring of power or acquiring of money acquiring of material things is nothing just investigate it will not give you an everlasting result it is temporary it is momentary so you just balance yourself this need a great vigor it needs great will to solve chanda so in this three category chanda virya and vimangsa is very important in combating the stress patience cannot be overstated here patience is very important developing mindfulness as a way of life takes a lot of work but it's so worth we need to have patience and allow things to develop and come as they are be compassionate with yourself as you tend to face some uncomfortable things about yourself at this point practicing your mindfulness practice truly is the most important effort here not just for clarity and calm say but also to stay non judgmental this will help uh, generating and maintaining self compassion truth is the situation because we cannot deny look at us we are in this covid situation this is the most important truth we cannot deny the situation often comes and change ourselves and we have to come back with our day to day uh, has to has to and we have to fight back that also and this way it causes anxiety in ourselves and we can never go away it will stay with us but ha- within this we have to stay happy and calm and comfortable never every day confronting with challenges that takes the patience but just because this potential stresses exist does not mean you have to control by them you can change your relationship with these stresses by changing how you relate to them you cannot only manage them better but with time you can cut off the source of the stress and anxiety altogether and be patient be present and compassionate uh, compassionate for the healing process relief is possible if you lead the life of mindfulness and the wisdom right thank you very much for your patience hearing thank you thank you very much dr chakraborty for making a very beautiful a very well thought out presentation on buddhism particularly uh, the stress management from the perspective of buddhism and you have mentioned some of the very clear and very distinct points like harmony and amity is the basic foundation of buddhist thought also it is found in almost all the 
all the religious religious way all the religious institutional religious form in different way second point you have mentioned that uh, dukkha is a very uh, very buddhistic term we find this word in pali eh? dukkha buddhistic term mm, yeah. and it has it, it has health dimension social dimension mental dimension and it is psycho social uh, somatic psycho somatic and psycho social di yeah dimensions are there and we can control the the beauty of buddhism lies in in this point that buddhism believes there is sorrow there is reason behind sorrow and sorrow can be eradicated so this is the beauty this logical understanding to deal with sorrow is the beauty of buddhism so madam you have also mentioned uh, brought these issues to our attention particularly you told about meditation and meditative practice of buddhism with reference to that five way of eradicating our evil thought and five roots of stress and three categories to prevent to fight against the stress so this is a very uh, your paper gives a very brief and very clear picture of the buddhist thought actually at the very beginning dhammapada starts with uh, with mind yeah mano pubbang gama dhamma mano sitta mano maya mano sache padutthena vasati va karoti va so mind uh, yes yes so mind and and the basic logic of uh, buddhist way is to it is better to say the very buddhist word buddhanu sasana it is buddhanu sasana according to dhamma but the, according to buddhanu sasana buddhist way we have to we have to uh, change our polluted mind to a pure mind mano sache padutthena mano sache prasannena we have to change our produced mind to prasanna mind so you have highlighted all these all these points in your lecture and it was really very really very nice and very interesting also particularly with reference to stress management uh, of today's situation to talk about the way buddha way i just want to give some comparative reference that the way the term way is also there in bible i am the way uh, th this is there i am the way i am the life eh? that way is also yeah. there in in, in shrimad bhagavad gita mama vartma anuvartante anusha manushya partha sarvasa vartma is the way and even in islam siratul mustaqim the straight way way is there so perhaps way is same but we think different religious personalities they have thought in different way so uh, I, I, we just uh, want to take some questions and again yeah. from the uh, from the uh, part of uh, brc and the from the part of kolkata asian studies uh, i i would like to congratulate you for your beautiful presentation and uh, let you, us come to uh, namaste namaskar namaskar no namaskar yeah. for highlighting uh, these such things uh, okay, i okay. really let... didn't touch up the this uh, phenomenology here i just yes, uh, actually find this today dhammapada if i start on dhammapada itself will take another lecture <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Need yes, another yes. thirty minutes time to give us. Yes, yes, yes. Thank, thank you. We can, we can take up some questions. So, sure. please. But I cannot read it. Can you? Can anybody read the question for me? Yes, I, I ask uh, Shivangi Madam to please read if there is any question. Yes, ma'am. The question is. Thanks. Yes, yes. The question is, what is the language of the te teachings you are narrating? These, there is a new Japanese version of Buddhism, probably in Japanese language. Uh, that was asked by one of our uh, participants. Can you please highlight uh, some key points if you uh, have? There is some organization which is going on in Japan, Reisho Koshikai and all. They are uh, relating to this point of uh, practices, but I am focusing on the Pali. Pali is the Theravadin doctrine literature canonized in Tibetan culture. 
so the term which is used here is mainly from the canonical literature but in buddhist uh, has a huge panoramic view so it has uh, very manifested in broader way so you might get some phases there in japanese or in chinese because in there are a lot of sects like sadama pundarika sect and amitayu sect in china you'll get some phases like that because actually it is the theravada buddhism from where this all things are coming so it is a uh, of uh, emanated from this original sources and i haven't uh, mentioned uh, the buddhist as i was telling so regarding the buddhist phenomenology as you can psychosomatic uh, things or ethical things i just uh, mentioned and confined my lecture to this three sutras there is another sutra called sabha sava sutra which also talk about this measure i hope i will able to answer your queries next question then that was the only question we had okay this uh, there okay. were more comments more like uh, i'll just read out some Uh, yeah, spirituality yeah, yeah. is i believe my god would expect me to love others and not judge anyone so this is what yeah. i try to do this was by rita ji then there was another good nice comment which was nev uh, sorry never religion can give peace of mind it is spirituality which can give peace of mind this was again by dr uh, uh, smith rita so these were some nice quotes that they came up with yeah religion will not give you peace of mind it's, uh, it is not so like that uh, it is that the peace of mind depends on you uh, buddhism yes. is something which is which relate to the way of life it gives a way of life it, it started with the word the first sermon can you imagine it started with dukkha suffering it is the cause of all misery so religion it started with some practices on but buddha tracks first uh, as he has given that the balancing madhyama patipada is very much important and very much pertinent and relevant for our today's uh, turbulence and part of society so we always do balance no two extremes we are balancing in family in society in everywhere in the workplace we are balancing so balancing is very important so it is also included in the religion so peace uh, is related to here because if you can do balancing automatically peace will follow because i am happy with what i am have Isn't it? And there's one more like question. That. Yeah. And there's one more question. How will you describe sure. the concept of time and its relationship with sorrow, according to the Buddhist theology? If you according can highlight. According to the Buddhist theology, yes, yeah, time changes because uh, when you're young, you it gives some new phases. In the, from Buddha, uh, in the later phase, uh, if you say that it is totally different from our today's topic, we. Uh, find a debased form of buddhism in the 10th century to 16th century as we call it the tantra jana where the time span is different and we have got a huge text and huge uh, um, sect we can call is kala chakra tantra it related to the kalpa or yans of the time so it is a different one here in the theravada buddhism time is different kala is not in such way that is the it is the path is one of the uh, potential um, of it is a potential thing which you have to face you have to go through it is like that thank you ma'am okay it was a very educational okay. session i'm sure and i'm sure everyone have learned a lot uh, i'm very so much the, thankful this, to you people <laughs> so with very this we nice end our you. today's session and our today's thank day you. Uh, yeah. thank you to all the esteemed speakers and our uh, moderators for helping us make this a success and i hope to see everyone tomorrow again uh, join us at 6 pm the links will be shared on email and uh, tomorrow will be our final day for this amazing webinar see you tomorrow yeah. bye see you tomorrow bye bye thank you good night namaskar thank you